sofa. I sit like the Dr. Evil chair, and it really does feel like that now I'm sitting in it. Um, we're still in the morning, aren't we? Good morning, everybody. Um, so we're here to talk to you today about the reinvention of media brands in the digital space. Um, and so I'm going to kick things off by asking Charles um, to talk just very briefly about how Forbes Life has done that and taken what was a well-established brand and grown it uh, in the digital world. Sure. So uh, good morning. Um, my remit is across all of uh, Forbes Media's uh, platforms. Uh, but in the last uh, four or five years, our business has undergone a significant transformation. We've had a uh, complete business DNA overhaul of the brand. And that's partly because of the, the huge uh, shifts in media consumption habits of, of the target audience. Um, it's fueled by social media. It's fueled by mobile. And it's also fueled by the fact that we recognize that the uh, economics behind journalism or the economics behind web publishing are fundamentally broken. So we, we had a significant transformation in our business. We made four uh, big changes that have contributed to quite a lot of disruption within uh, the traditional media set. Um, the first thing we did was we allowed uh, outside contributors uh, to use the same content management system that our everyday journalists, staff editors use on a day-to-day -day basis. That meant our newsroom has grown very, very aggressively from uh, to, to now what's almost probably just short of 2,000 people. Um, the second thing we did, we, we, uh, we, we gave them access to the same system, but we also changed the compensation model on how we pay contributors. The traditional model is on a by how many words or a tenancy fee. We pay contributors by how many followers they have. The larger the audience they attract to Forbes.com, the more money they get paid. And then finally, and more in, uh, under my uh, uh, sort of wheel, so to speak, is the commercial side of the business. We completely turned that upside down on its head. And we invited marketers for a fee to connect directly with our audience. And that's our, our native advertising play. And that's a product called uh, Brand Voice. And it's, those are the sort of the, the, the overarching changes that we've made to the business in the last five years. And it's meant we've built a unique, uh, scalable model. And, uh, and, and digital plays a, a hugely important part of that success. Can I just ask very quickly, when you're speaking to advertisers, are they asking for your overall readership? And do you, do you lump your print and digital together and your followers? Or are you still talking to advertisers in a slightly different way, separating those audiences out? I mean, it's case by case. Um, let's say the, the commercial or the, the sales teams around the world are responsible for articulating the Forbes story across every single platform. So be that programmatic, digital display, offline uh, in events and magazines. So in an ideal situation, we naturally want our clients to be buying us uh, integrated cross-media platform deals. But there's naturally some instances where some advertisers are only interested in the digital side uh, or they're only interested in the magazine side. OK. So Carla, coming to you, you've got three people with almost the same name on the stage this <laughs> afternoon. Uh, so you're head of audience development. Actually, you have a very lofty job title. I'll let you, I'll yes. let you give that. Um, but your background's as a journalist. So how have you personally seen your transition, your media brand, arguably, in the last few years Absolutely. change? So as, as an individual, mm. I would say that we certainly have seen um, journalists really needing to um, really refine their own brands and represent the brand of wherever they're working. Um, and one of the things that we've done at the Journal is really bringing in quite a bit of the learnings from our business partners. In the past, there was this very strong wall dividing us. Um, but, but there was a, quite a bit of knowledge from both sides. And my role, which is a, a brand new role at the Journal, really bridges that gap. So it's looking at audience engagement, looking at audience development, newsroom analytics, and figuring out new platforms for us to um, expand out to. I was thinking about what we were going to discuss today and thinking that I wouldn't really say that we have rebranded ourselves. No. The Wall Street Journal actually has taken an approach of doubling down on what we know we're really good at. Okay, so you so, haven't so much reinvented the brand as extended it. Extended it, exactly. Okay. So, so the Wall Street Journal will be celebrating 126 years next year. Um, and, and we understand that our core areas of, of business, technology, finance, um, with the, the uh, 
elements that really help someone attain success in their okay. lives. Yep. So that might be talking about luxury, that might be our mansion section. Um, you know, what, what is it that somebody aspirational is, is really responding to yeah. or entrepreneurial? Um, so we're always focusing around that and figuring out what are the different spaces where we can really be active with those people who we know we have something in common with and that we can provide value to. Okay. Um, and so, so is that sort of about the DNA of the brand? Yes. I mean, you're talking about luxury and things like that, which actually, Absolutely. Charles, you can probably talk in very detail about that, but it's about keeping that DNA, whatever platform you might be on. Absolutely. And I, I mean, one of the things I can tell you, it, it's certainly keeping that DNA, but also understanding how different consumers are consuming content, right? So, um, you know, the Wall Street Journal just 10 years ago didn't even have images on the front page of the newspaper. In 2007, we, we had no images. It was just printed words. There was a website that had launched in 1996. It was actually the first um, digital site for a legacy publication. Um, and the, there was really a lot of work that needed to go into understanding how other people are communicating and really getting in touch with that reader. Yeah. My business partners call the readers customers. The newsroom calls them readers. And we've had to come together and understand that it's really all about them. Okay. It's about the audience and, and figuring out where they are and, and finding the most authentic way for the journal to, to be in those spaces and not cheapen the brand. Okay. Charles, what do you call your audience, users, clients? Uh, well, exactly <laughs> the same, but I, I definitely agree on the point that um, we have to get closer and closer to the audience's agenda um, versus perhaps driving our agenda. And so consequently, that's why we reinvented or repositioned the business for, shall we say, uh, an era of social journalism. And that's, that's what the, those changes in that model allowed us to do. Do you think it's important for a new audience, so thinking about potentially a younger audience or an audience outside of your core one, to see you as a different brand? Or is it important for them to understand the heritage that comes with something like Forbes? Um, I'm not sure whether or not it's important for them to understand the heritage. I mean, the, the core, although the core mission of what Forbes stands for, that hasn't changed, that remains unwavered. We write, we write about entrepreneurial capitalism. In terms of attracting a new audience, well, 50% of our audience comes uh, to Forbes.com through a mobile device. 40% of our audience is aged between 18 and 34. Uh, the next generation or the millennial audience is absolutely critical and a vital part of our, our makeup and strategy and vision uh, moving forward. And incidentally, probably Forbes is well known for the, uh, the famous rich list, be it the billionaires list or the Forbes 400 richest Americans or the Global 2000. Um, these lists scale and get an enormous amount of traffic online. But the largest list event, the largest social media event that we have under our umbrella is our 30 under 30 franchise. 30 individuals under the age of 30 across about 20 categories. And that's uh, started with a list uh, in the magazine, uh, a list online, uh, is now a significant uh, part of our conference business. We just had an event in Philadelphia three weeks ago, and we're bringing that 30 under 30 franchise uh, into Europe, into Tel Aviv and Jerusalem in April, uh, and Asia in the latter part of next year. So that is a core component. It of, is a uh, total myth that BuzzFeed invented lists. <laughs> <laughs> Forbes has been doing it for years and years and, it, and years. If I could just add something to it, I think one of the things for, for the journal is that we are... We, we don't really think about demographics in that way, so we're not looking at age or gender or, or um, demographics necessarily. Okay. We're looking at the psychographics, right? Who has that success gene? Who is it that is, is um, aspiring to something better? And once they've achieved success, how do they retain that? And, and when you start thinking about things that way, which I, you know, my, my mother is a therapist. This is something that comes very natural to me, thinking about what really motivates someone, what really drives them. Then we just clear away the age thing. And, and it's much easier to stay committed to your brand and, and who you are. So my, my creative side loves that idea. <laughs> but having sat in millions of meetings with advertisers, mm -hmm. how do you translate that when someone is sitting there who's trying to... I don't know, sell cereal 
for want of a better example, and says, we are targeting this audience, we want this age group, we want this gender. Right. How do you right. marry those two things? So we really, uh, the way that we look at, at social journalism or, or off-platform publishing, which I'm sure we'll, we'll discuss, <laughs> is, is thinking through what audience is there, and of course, age group has a lot to do with it, right? So if we're talking about um, the audience that is prevalent on Facebook or on Snapchat or, or whatever platform we're looking at, though, that's where we can really talk about um, being able to meet those needs from advertisers. But I come from the newsroom, and, and the most important thing for my uh, the KPIs that I'm trying yeah. to reach are that we make sure that no matter what platform we're on, we're always speaking with the same degree of integrity and ethics and standards and, and being creative in how we reach those different audiences, but remembering that whether they're 65 or, or 25, that they're ultimately driven by, by something that, that they have in common. Okay, so that's a sense of purpose. Charles, I just want to come back to what you were saying about events. So about four and a half years ago, I launched the Huffington Post in the UK. We didn't have a huge marketing budget. In fact, we had zero marketing budget on day one. And we had to grow a brand that was known uh, with political circles. It was known in media circles, but not outside of that. And actually, one of the first things we did was throw real live events. So for a pure digital brand, we realized it, we needed to be out of just people's computers and mobile devices. So held events that we could create social traction around, we could create content around, but we could also bring the brand to life. Um, and for us as a digital only brand, we were learning from uh, news brands and media brands that had been around for a long time. Can you see a, a future, do you think that, that event space is important when you're thinking about reinventing or, or inventing brands? Uh, absolutely, and uh, again, again, it's figuring out ways for the marketers, uh, you know, the events element gives the marketers another access point uh, in terms of reaching these individuals on a face-to-face on a -face basis. Obviously, it's a little bit different to, to what, you, what you're doing there. We, we have an established global footprint. There's 37 yeah. local languages. We've been in the market for quite a considerable time. But also, I, in a funny way, though, the success of Forbes internationally um, probably drills down more to the digital side of the business uh, than the print side of the business. Um, we have over 10 million unique users in Europe, and the revenues are predominantly uh, digital revenues out of this marketplace. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I ask you both, and we'll start with you, Carla, for, we've talked about our brands, but what about other brands, and not necessarily in the media space, that you think are really making the most of digital world to grow their brand footprint or, or to reinvent themselves? I mean, the two that I, w that I think of most often would be AJ Plus and, and Vox, to me. They are not only digital natives in the sense of how they're publishing, but they truly understand the social journalism behind it, mobile storytelling. Um, they're truly mobile first. And, yeah. and I think we throw around that term <laughs> quite often and, yeah. and people aren't necessarily doing that. Um, I just wanted to also just note something about events. Mm -hmm. um, we launched something called WSJ Plus, which is a, a subscription only um, event uh, mechanism where we really connect with our readers. Mm -hmm. and, and I think both in terms of growing the brand and, and connecting with folks, um, the engagement that you find when you're able to connect with someone on social, on the site, in person, is, is tremendous. Our, um, the events go from hosting you know, a, a luxury concert, very small, intimate space, um, with, with, you know, Broadway celebrities, um, all sorts of celebrities, to inside the newsroom kind of events. And I'll tell you that the inside the newsroom events are one of the best attended really? events. Okay. So there, there's something that I think that people, as much as we think that they're, they're not apt to really connect and bond with a brand, yep. um, they really are willing and hungry for it. They okay. want to see behind the curtain. Yeah. And Charles, come to you. I'm Any not going to uh, sort of pick out a particular publisher or media owner. Uh, I, I'm going to sort of switch it slightly to, I think what's interesting is, is the marketers that I work with, we're starting to see them be uh, extremely successful in brand publishing or brand journalism. Um, probably the stand-up example that I can relate to uh, at Forbes is the German software company SAP. 
who are phenomenal at publishing content on our site. Um, and, and in many instances, actually, on Forbes.com, you'll see sometimes the actual brands, the marketers are the most popular or have the most read pieces of content over and above the staffers and over and above the contributors. So what I guess my, from my take or my angle, what I'm seeing is, is seeing brands, the marketers themselves, becoming, because their insight and perspective, you know, that provides value to our audience. And more and more, that's trending and, uh, and tracking really well uh, on Forbes. Can I, can I just ask, yeah. so why do you think that is, though? I, I, if, if trust is something <coughs> that we need, why would an audience be so open to reading something from a brand where they, they possibly have an agenda? That's a good point. I think uh, trust and transparency is, is really important. And actually, there was a trust study that Forbes did uh, that came out yesterday. And the two brands, and I'm not just saying this because I'm sat next to you, <laughs> but the two brands that are the most trustful in the business and financial space were the Wall Street Journal and Forbes. However, in, in terms of transparency, um, on Forbes, it's clearly labeled as to who's talking and what vantage point they're coming from. So if it says Carla contributor or Carla staff writer, or it says Microsoft Voice. Mm. Um, when it doesn't work uh, is when you start to blur the lines, right. or if something say, is supported by or brought to you by or in association with. The difference is we're giving that brand access, direct access to that same content management system, and it is very, very clearly labeled that that's who's talking and that's yeah. their vantage point. And the minute they go down the route of trying to sell a product or a service, that's an immediate turn off for mm -hmm. the audience. So let's think of it, it's more of a thought leadership platform mm -hmm. as opposed to selling a particular product. Yeah, I'm kind of smiling wryly here because having gone through those experiences with HuffPost and brands sure. wanting to blog on the site and those who just were trying to force a message, it just didn't right. work, didn't work yeah. at all. And yet some of them, the clever ones, the marketers who I think really understood content. And content marketing is such an old-fashioned phrase, but it, it's actually the right one in this instance. They've, they've worked out how to do that correctly. And the more and more they do it, the more and more data and analytics that they, that they take on board, they start to learn how to publish for the audience. So you start to learn how to write for the LinkedIn audience versus the Twitter audience, right. how you position your headline, where you put an infographic in, where you put a video in. And as you, it's not something you're just going to get in a month's no. time. These guys have actually been publishing on Forbes for five years, but they're the, a standout example of uh, success in brand okay. journalism. I'm going to sign up WGSN, I think, this afternoon <laughs> to the Forbes network. OK, one last thought from both of you. Millennials, we haven't used that word yet, but but given you're talking about the audience that you want in the future, how are you going to try and reach them and get more of them interacting with your brands? Carla. I mean, the, so it goes back to what I've been describing. It's, it's making sure that we're speaking with that same authenticity that we're talking about with different brands. Yeah. Um, I think millennials are, uh, and I hate speaking in general terms like this, <laughs> but um, the generation is, is incredibly savvy. They understand the inner workings of marketing. Um, they, uh, they use marketing tools themselves to, to brand um, their presence on social media. Um, so it's really about making sure that we're not just the old man who's trying to yeah. tell young jokes yeah. at a party. Um, I'm very aware of that. And, and really making sure that we are everywhere where they are. So that we, we were speaking a few moments beforehand. Yeah. It may not be that we connect with them at this point, but introducing them to the Wall Street Journal and saying to them, you don't need to wait until you've succeeded and you've gotten that C-suite job. You can start right now, and this is a tool that's going to help you move up that ladder. Um, and, and really, the other thing that I would say is that using social media or different platforms or different storytelling methods, whether it's video um, or, or visual journalism, um, and really using that as almost a storefront yeah. where, where we're attracting folks um, at whatever age to the deeper content that, that we host on our site or on those different platforms, okay. introducing and, them. And Charles, you agree with all those points? Uh, absolutely. Um, I noticed the clock's counting the other <laughs> way, so I'll be really quick. Um, I think uh, a really interesting development that we've made is, is a 30 under 30 app. Uh, and the people on the app are purely on the list. So it's, for us, it's thinking more and more about communities. 
Um, so it's about the right audience for the advertiser targeting the right people. So we have an app with 1,500 people. They're, they're 30 under 30. Uh, we'll extend that geographically. And then uh, this week, we've also launched a specific 30 under 30 channel uh, on Forbes.com. So. OK, interesting. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Thank you.